Um, say thank you to Don Winter. He's a brilliant physicist, biochemical engineer. He works for IBM, and he just basically gave us his free time. He came all the way from Cornwall just to be here today. He's off, leaving the country to, to tomorrow. I mean, so could you please give a warm welcome? <laughs> So thank you for inviting me to your fabulous school, Copeland. I understand that this school specializes in science, and that's good because that's part of what we're focused on today. The other thing I understand about your school is that what you have here is an extreme diversity of young people who have different spiritual backgrounds, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, extreme diversity. And part of the subject of today's conversation is using science to understand that spirituality is all talking about the same thing. And that if we actually understood spirituality with science, we would not need religion wars. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the title of today's talk, the title of today's talk is called The New Fractal Science of Life. And the subtitle is The Unified Science of Spirit. And what we mean by spirit is something that I learned about in electrical engineering school. <clears throat> How often, or you don't often think about the word spirit using electrical terms, do you? No. But did you know that several very famous people like Einstein and Jesus Christ, they all believed in a unified field. You know what a unified field means? A unified field means that Everything in physics is made of the same substance. It's truly about oneness. Now that sounds relatively spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> oneness. But in, how do we understand that in scientific terms? The closest science we have to unified field is the symmetry that connects gravity to electromagnetism using something called a fractal. If you want to understand what a fractal is, you can think of a fraction of the all. <laughs> But a fractal, you can imagine a rose, an onion, a pine cone, where the inside looks like the outside. I do suggest that if you're interested in science, you do learn about fractals, because it's one of the most profound scientific and spiritual things you can study. And so we're going to look today at the fractal nature of spirit, and actually look at the nature of science, and how we kind of can understand more about the purpose of life in a way that combines spirituality and science into oneness. Because if you think your spiritual body is different than your physical body, that's not a unified field. That's schizophrenia, right? Truly. So in order to have a unified field, you, know, you needed to understand that your spiritual body is part of physics. And that gives you the power of unified field thinking. So how are we going to start that thinking? We're going to consider that in terms of your aura, the charge around your body, to understand the purpose of life in terms of building the aura, the charge around your body, something in Egypt that was called the ka, you know, the merkaba. Your ka in Egypt was called the boat into the underworld, that with, with which you would take into a lucid dream or even into death. <coughs> So now we're going to try to use electrical engineering, which happens to be my field, to understand the nature of the spiritual body. And to start that conversation, I ask you a simple question. If somebody were to say to you, <clears throat> what is the difference between a live seed and a dead seed? Anybody know how you would tell? <coughs> Thoughts? Are different color. That's a clue, yes. What, how else would you know if the seed were alive or dead? Yes? You planted the dead seed and wouldn't grow. That's exactly right. So now, what exactly is it that makes that seed alive? Now, I'm an electrical engineer. I'd like to know what life is. I'm studying the seed. I'm planting one in the ground it grows, and the other in the ground it's dead. And I say to you, what is life? What is the difference? If you're studying what's happening when a seed is about to germinate, what you see is the seed has an electric field. It's called the plasma. It's very similar to the concept of plasma in a seed. It's the charge, the bubble of electric charge around that seed. And you know how you can tell life or death? 
there's a water molecule over here. A live seed has a tractor beam, you know, like in Star Trek, and it can suck in a water molecule. That ability to suck in a water molecule into the electric field of that seed is the difference between life or death. So, I'm sorry, I'm an electrical engineer. I tell you, from my conclusion of having studied that, that the secret of life is that electric field. Where did it come from? What is it? What is the electric field that allows that seed to actually be alive instead of dead? So, I have to say that I've been studying this for quite some time, and um, I'm beginning to form a hypothesis of how to make an electric field to cause a seed to germinate. It's a very interesting study. Remember, our subject is, what is the electric field, the charged envelope, the bubble with plasma, or simply what we call the sphere? What is it that makes that alive? We know that if we take, <coughs> if we take seeds that are about to germinate, and we place them in a container that has a certain kind of electric field, like, for example, Stonehenge, a pyramid, that you can measure <coughs> as much as a 30% difference in growth. In fact, they're studying the uh, Stonehenge and other earthworm structures, and they've discovered that one of the main things that these centrifugal, these uh, concentric rings of sacred stones, like Stonehenge, one of the main reasons they were built was people were trucking in buckets full of seeds. They didn't plant the seeds there, they just sat the seeds there and charged them, and then took the seeds and planted them, and they grew, and there's new measures, there's new science that shows a 300% change in growth of that seed. So our little mystery plot is thickening here. Something about the secret of life is contained in the electric field of sacred space. Do you know where the word the word altar comes from? You know, you go into the Bible and they say, and I will build an altar unto the Lord. <clears throat> and if you research the ancient term for altar in church, the word in Sumerian for that is Shem, S-H-E-M, from which we get the word Shem as in Shaman, a Shem An. <laughs> An means sun god. A Shem <coughs> refers to a particular kind of stone. And a famous author named Zachariah Sitchin, that many of you may have heard of, spent many years studying that word. <clears throat> and he determined that the word Shem, which became the word altar in church, means highward fire stone. <laughs> We've been studying that translation, and now we know what it means. It means a certain kind of capacitor called fractal. A fractal capacitor is an attractor, one that can suck in charge. That ability to suck in an electric field to attract charge in physics is called a centripetal force. You know what centripetal means? It's the opposite of centrifugal. A centrifugal vortex is one that pushes outward. You can think of that as electropositive. Whereas a centripetal electric field is one that pulls inward, electronegative. And that ability for an electric field to be centripetal, to suck in charge, it kind of sucks you in. <laughs> it's kind of attractive. In fact, I think I'd like to be attractive. <laughs> right? So what's causing this electric donut to be attractive? Yeah? Something sucking that in. Well, I tell you that that seed that sucked in a water molecule that knew how to be alive, knew how to have an electric field that did this. It was centripetal. It was implosive, opposite of explosive, and that was the secret of life. To make a charge field that implodes, that contracts, that compresses charge. Well, it just happens in physics that the main quality of being fractal <coughs> is to have the ability to compress perfectly. In fact, the definition of fractal is infinite, non-destructive, or constructive compression. Remember poor Mr. Einstein? Einstein goes to his deathbed. He figured out that the solution to his unified field is infinite constructive compression. But poor guy, nobody ever told him what a fractal was. So he never figured out the cause of gravity. He did not know. He did not know why an object falls to the ground. You see? 
And not knowing why, why an object falls to the ground meant that he did not know what life is, sadly. And yet now, we, now that we know, <clears throat> we actually now know, it's the new physics. I'm announcing to you today a humble new physics, <clears throat> replacing Einstein's mistake. <laughs> I'm humble about this, of course. <laughs> the, the, the humble new physics is we now actually do know why an object falls to the ground. It's a new physics which I have pioneered, which announces that fractality is the electric reason there is gravity. For example, atoms, the inside, if it's the same shape, if the nucleus is the same shape as the outside, the electron shell, then that self-similar or fractal relationship invites the perfect collapse of charge, which was Einstein's definition of gravity. And I recently proved that by taking what's called the Planck length in physics, which is the wavelength into which everything in physics divides evenly. So it defines the sacred, it's the universal music of all of physics. I took the Planck length times the golden mean relationship, golden mean ratio, which we're going to talk about, and I derived the shape of hydrogen. So we know how hydrogen makes gravity. We know the cause of gravity because we know how it is that all centripetal forces are generated. And this is a pretty, um, this is a pretty fun new physics. It's worth uh, your attention. And it does solve the science of life. So what, what the science says is that perfect fractal compression, or sometimes called phase conjugation. To conjugate means to add and multiply. You know, like when you get married, you have conjugal relations? <laughs> well, the DNA finds out which way is that. <laughs> and, and, and that's called conjugation. It's a test for pure so, so when waves get together and they add and multiply perfectly, it's called conjugating. And that's another name for fractality. And this pattern where waves, the inside looks like the outside, and again, it's so easy to get a picture in your head of what this is, Imagine a rose. You got it. Okay? So that picture of how waves converge, called fractality, is the electric origin cause and mechanism of gravity, life force, perception, enlightenment, <laughs> the origin of bliss, actually, ecstatic process. It's actually the origin of color. It's the origin of alphabet. It's a beautiful new physics. And it's so much fun, I'm going to show you some pictures, okay? <laughs> so, here are the pictures. That if we took the, this path that waves make, this is the path that waves would make on their way down into DNA. And that path is called the Holy Grail. You see, that's a golden mean spiral that traveled down into the center of a vortex. And if you rotate that spiral, you get what's called the holy grail in the blood. It's better than the history. Except it's real physics. Isn't it? It gets me excited. So we can actually take this beautiful picture, you know, Indiana Jones and the whole trip. It's actually about making the electric field that causes light. We can take that information and design an electric field that not only causes a seed to germinate, but reduces aging. <laughs> you know what the people who have studied this are saying? That the people who designed Stonehenge were actually designing an electric field to prevent aging. Could that be interesting? And you know what they say that field is? They say that field is a fractal field or phase conjugate. It's an electric field that has the symmetry to cause light. And this is a test. Now, I don't know if you can see that from here. You see this shape here, this shape right here? You see that that's two golden mean spirals from a side view to a top view. Does anybody know what the name of that is? Do you recognize that shape? Yes. It's a golden spiral. It's a golden spiral from here, and from this point of view, what's it called? Here's a clue. It's the symbol of Hermes, medicine, healing, and DNA. Yes. What is that symbol? Anybody know? What's the symbol of Hermes? Anybody know? It's called a caduceus. Caduceus. You know, you go to a doctor's office and you see that those two snakes go up and down? 
In mythology, that's called a caduceus. In physics, do you know what it's called? Phase conjugation. Perfect place and way for waves to meet and converge. Non-destructive compression. And that pattern of waves creates what's called scale invariance. And that, that picture of how waves work is the solution to what's called implosion, fusion, zero point energy, omega point, spill point, the black hole. How many here have studied nonlinear energies? Like, I would like to make quote unquote free energy, right? Everybody's interested in this nonlinear energy technology. Well, you know what the key is? The key is making an electric field that's fractal enough to get voltage from gravity. And you know what's good at doing that? A pine cone. Well, I'm an electrical engineer. I study how pine cones get voltage from gravity, and I have figured out how to get voltage from gravity. Is it free energy? No. Is it a unified field? Yes. Okay. The point is that all these ancient mysteries about alchemy and omega point, the bindu point, the zero point, these ancient mysteries are actually about pure symmetry physics, real serious science that reveals the nature of spirituality. It's fun, right? So if you want to make a black hole, let's look at the question this way. Does anybody know the origin of the word chemistry? You've been to your chemistry class, right? From Egypt. Yes? Did your chemistry teacher tell you the origin of the word chem, as in chemistry teacher? From Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's from Egypt. It's, it's from Egypt. Egypt. Good, good. You got that right. It was, in fact, the original name of Egypt, chem. And you know why it was named chem? It was named chem because Enki Hermes Thoth had blue-black skin. He was black. And you know what? The word chem means black. But it means black in another sense of the word as well. It means ability to make or access a black hole. So chemistry is the study of how to access and make black holes. Now if you study the latest physics, and I'm referring to Nassim Haramin, the resonanceproject.org, I mean the latest hot, super cool physics for new sources of energy, good stuff. You know what he says? He says that all of physics is made of nothing but black holes. And the reason a nucleus attracts electrons is because a proton is a black hole. And he's got the physics to prove it. So how do you make a black hole? Well, I guess we need to know chemistry, or maybe we need to know alchemy. You know what alchemy is? Alchemy is the study of the shape of plasma, of charge, that makes that fusion. So you can see that these sciences for discovering how these waves work are actually connecting the mythological idea of, of real immortality with the real physics of how you make an aura. Now, you know, a lot of us get up every day and we go to work and we say, oh, shit, I have to go to work again. <laughs> and, and then we go home and we say, oh, it's a mess around here. And then you think to yourself, well, what am I living for? Perfectly reasonable question. And you do that day after day and get a little, like, really depressed or unhappy about things. And you say, well, there must be a reason for life. So then you say, well, I need someone to ask this question. And you find a priest or a rabbi, a Mormon priest, a Muslim priest. You find someone who's spiritual. And you say, what is the reason for life? He says, well, the reason for life is you need to become immortal. Good enough. I happen to be an electrical engineer. I would like to define immortality from my graduate or undergraduate electrical engineering degree. Electrical engineering. I'd like to know what immortality is. Hello. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so I've been studying immortality as an electrician. Okay. And what I have this. I'm working with this professor. His name is Dr. Karatkov. Dr. Karatkov lives in Russia, and he's invented a system for measuring your aura called GDV, Gas Discharge Visualization. And it's very interesting, I, I recommend it. Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple pictures. There's about 10,000 medical doctors using this system to do clinical diagnosis. 
And this is relevant because this is part of our study of the coherence of your aura, which we're about to explain to you is what you can take with you when you die. To get your shit, I mean your stuff together. <laughs> so, 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 so the ability to get your plasma, your aura, assembled, like pull yourself together, Osiris, you know how that goes? So the ability to get your plasma, your aura, assembled is measurably, and I'm telling you, electrical engineer, that it's measurable what you take with you when you die. Here's the introduction. Supposing you're a young kid... And the, and the guy next door says, oh, I got some hot, heavy drugs here. I'd like to try these drugs. And you say, well, wait, uh, maybe there's some issues. It turns out that if you take too many drugs, let's call them recreational drugs, what happens is that your aura here gets whole and it's measurable. So next time you think somebody, you know when people take too many drugs, their attention span gets shorter? Do you know why? It's because the, the coherence of their electric field has gotten porous and holy. Holy? <laughs> I mean, they have holy. It's actually measurable. This is something called astral hygiene, and it's teachable to electrical engineers. But I just want to ex explain to you how this is done. There's hundreds of medical clinical studies, and this system is being used by the American Medical Association, gas discharge visualization. You take a curlian high technology voltage fingerprint. You know what Curlian photograph is? Photography of aura. It's a high voltage discharge that measures the capacitive charge of the electric field, in this case around your fingertips, but by doing hundreds of studies they can tell which part of your body is associated with which finger. So here's your white, right thumb, your second right, third right finger, fifth, fifth finger, your baby finger, this part of the aura of this fingertip is telling you <coughs> what condition your heart is in. And this is clinically documented and medically known and well utilized <coughs> around the world. It's called GDP. I recommend Karatov.org. The inventor is a professor, a friend of ours from St. Petersburg. So, now we have a way to measure your aura. It's hard science. We know whether you have the Ka, as in Merkaba, a boat into the underworld, if that, if that baby right there is together. Now we need to know how do you charge that thing. Well, how you charge that thing actually is an introduction to the physics of having bliss. Does anybody here know what ecstasy is? Yeah. I don't necessarily mean the drug. Oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, as a, m my other graduate degree in psychophysiology from the University of Detroit was building polygraphs. And I've been building polygraphs and biofeedback devices for years which teach and measure the nature of bliss and ecstasy. So we can actually measure when you're having, you went to the rave concert and got really happy. Turns out it's measurable, isn't it cool? <laughs> so the, the nature of of what you can take with you. So first I'm going to show you how bliss and ecstasy work in terms of measurement, and then I'm going to show you how you take that with you when you die. And this is all hard science, okay? So first, the nature of bliss and ecstasy. Let me give you an example. Here's our friend Dr. Karakoff from St. Petersburg, very famous, Karakoff.org. He's a hero. Man, this guy is a hero. He goes to the poor kids. He's gone to the tribes in South America and Africa and measured their sacred space. It's really cool stuff. But anyway, here, he's in Russia, and they have a program. The program is called World Without Blindness. The project is to teach kids to see without their eyes. If you're blind or not blind, it doesn't matter. If you'd like to be able to see without your eyes, come on over here, they'll show you. So... The kids go through this program for learning how to see without their eyes, and one of the steps, of the, and, and there's all kinds of television shows. You see the kid blindfolded there? He's able to see without their eyes. They show him these cards, and he can read the cards even though he's blindfolded. He can see without his eyes. And he's learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, Karatkov, Karatkov's job as the local electrical engineer was to measure 
was to make the electrical measurement of the kids who succeeded in seeing without their eyes. And so he did their brainwave analysis and he measured their aura and their electroencephalogram, their brain waves, and he did an electrical description of which kids were able to see without their eyes. Now the kids are attaining a state called peak perception, peak experience, hint, hint, ecstasy, bliss, enlightenment. Right? So what is the electrical quality that allows you to have peak perception? Ecstasy, bliss, and enlightenment. Well, here's the measure. But before we analyze the measure, let me give you a clue of how they got there. The kids are taught, okay, now you're sitting there. You're imagining yourself. You make a vivid inner picture of your body in beautiful nature. Nature. <laughs> and then your aura, your electric field, flips a switch, click, and gets fractal. It's true. It's measurable. And so what he did then, he measured. It turns out that when you have blessed ecstasy, peak experience, peak perception, your brain waves create the golden mean ratio. We're going to talk about that. Golden mean, 0.618. You know, the ge geometry of the sarcophagus of the Great Pyramid, the geometry of the Parthenon, golden mean rectangle, golden spiral, golden triangle. Very important physics behind golden mean. You can remember that by going to my website. It's goldenmean.info. Two million hits a month. Largest private website on the planet. Largest private television station on the planet. Okay? You can remember golden mean. It's a golden mean ratio that created bliss. So your brain waves make a frequency called golden mean ratio, and your aura gets bigger, and your aura gets more fractal. And the way they measure it is the fractality of the GDV, the fractality of the curling picture. So effectively what's happening is your brain wave is using this golden mean ratio. This is another example. This is, this is from what's called the mind mirror literature showing golden mean proportion between alpha and beta in brain waves. So the short version of this story is just that when you have bliss, when you have peak experience, your brain waves make a particular picture based on the golden mean ratio. Now, you need to ask, obviously, what is the golden mean ratio? And just let's go back just a little bit and show the pictures. If we look at... This is a golden mean spiral. You see the golden mean spiral on the bottom right? You see that that can make triangles. It can make squares. It can make pentagrams. It's the same spiral. You see that shape? And obviously that shape is sacred. In science, it's called optimized translation of vorticity. It's actually the name of how you create mass from energy. Because mass is the name of charge that goes in a circle, and energy is the name for the same charge that goes in a line. And the way you get between them constructively is the golden mean spiral. It's a very important electrical engineering idea. And every living protein, all living things in the universe, use this golden mean proportion, it's called equiangular spiral, because it's the only way that living things can get voltage from gravity. And the golden mean ratio defines beauty, and it actually defines perception. You see, this is called perfect branching, and it's the origin of our term divine, and the word scion, as in science, means to branch perfectly. So this perfect branching or perfect distribution of charge is actually an introduction to a very profound science. So anyway, I built a device, a technology, to measure for bliss and ecstasy, to actually make enlightenment teachable, <laughs> by measuring for this golden mean ratio in brain waves. Here's the golden mean ratio from the side and top view, the caduceus. And there's the golden mean proportion in brain waves between alpha and beta in brain waves. Does anybody know what alpha and beta are in brain waves? Have you heard about biofeedback, where you learn to make alpha frequencies in your brain waves? It's called the eidetic or the euphoric. That actually, for example, if you have attention deficit and you'd like to have quality attention, you actually you can use biofeedback for brain waves, and you won't need little. And you can shift gears in your own brain waves 
and heal attention deficit disorder. It's well documented. Yeah? It's much more self-empowering because you shift gears from within. And when you teach someone to make the, the frequencies, the harmonics in their brain waves, you give a little kid a Pac-Man game, and they start, the Pac-Man game starts moving every time they make the missing frequency in the brain waves. And kids learn to shift gears in their brain harmonics. And what they're learning is how to cause their charge field, their plasma, their chi, their spirit. They're learning how to make that implode. To suck in charge, to become sense of heat. And that, it turns out, is the very nature of perception. Now, that may sound a bit too profound for you, but there's another scientist named Steve Lehar who's also teaching that perception is caused by phase conjugation. It's actually perfect compression. I give you an example. Try it. Find your favorite super magical tree. Now, if you sit under your favorite super magical tree, relax, and then open your eyes, what do you notice? <coughs> what happens when you open your eyes sitting under your favorite super magical tree? <laughs> you feel sleepy. Uh, that wasn't the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, 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 anybody, anybody know? Yes. Pardon? You might see pictures, you might see illusions. Actually, in Celestian prophecy, they say that's a good way to discover new clairvoyance, to see elementals in nature school. But specifically, the answer I was looking for is your vision gets sharper. Actually, it's true. If you sit... Yes? Yes? That if you... If, yes? He said he was going to say that. Yeah? Good. Good. So that you, many of us have had that experience. If you sit in a sacred space your vision gets sharper. The reason your vision gets sharper there is because the waves are converging in a fractal. The electric field of that tree is fractal. Treeness, perfect branching, <coughs> perfect net. That's why, here's the simple physics. Attention is the frequency recipe of compression. So if you take out these fluorescent lights, which are actually have frequencies which are not good for producing attention, and you put in that kind of light, sunlight, it's well known you can measure a dramatic increase in attention span. You know why? What's the science? Anybody know the science? Because what produces attention is the ability to bring waves to focus, which is called perfect compression, or fractal, or phase conjugate, and that defines the very nature of attention. It turns out it's measurable. The book with evidence about that is called Health and Light by John Hopp, and he is a friend. So attention has a frequency recipe and is fractal. And peak attention or peak perception is this very nature of phase conjugation. Now phase conjugation you can study later, but in physics when you get into the stuff, you will see that phase conjugation is the only way, in fractality, is the only way physics has discovered self-organization. How to get any wave to emerge from chaos, physics has found one way. It's called phase conjugation or fractality. It opted. You get the waves opposite directions, you make a phase conjugate, and they self-organize. It's very cool. So it's, it's a deeper science. This is why it's called the new science of life, because this is what makes electric fields self-organize. So in advanced science, we have phase conjugate optics, phase conjugate dielectrics, and I have invented phase conjugate magnetic, and I have, I have created a 300% change in growth using that science. This is the other scientist who's talking about how to create perception using this perfect way for waves to converge on phase conjugate, Steve Lehar. You can read all about this on the website, but just briefly, this is my invention. It's called the Blitz Tool. Sounds cool, right? <laughs> Blitz Tool. <laughs> With the Blitz tuner, you measure Blitz process by learning the discipline of getting coherence in your brain waves. This is a lady in Australia. This lady is very, very blissful. We're measuring, this is what she's doing. <laughs> she, <didn't know. laughs> she was blissed out. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it was measurable. 
You know why it was measurable? Because during bliss, your brain waves make five, up to five harmonics in golden ratio, and that's called phase conjugation. And that's how your aura, your plasma, your chi, or your ka get centripetal, implode, fractal, and that is the very nature of compression. It's cool. It's powerful. So, I told you I'd show you a little bit. We have hundreds of screens. We don't have time for all these of how the biofeedback environment works. You can actually teach people to have bliss experiences using biofeedback. It's so cool. We did this in Australia. We had 5,000 kids that came to the Rainbow Serpent Festival. They were there for the big <laughs> The speakers were big enough to cause earthquakes, right? <laughs> and we were there to say, kids, you don't need drugs. <laughs> <laughs> We were there to say, kids, no, you, there's a self-empowering way to have bliss and ecstasy, and it's a musical recipe you make from inside for yourself. And it worked. Golden mean that info size, rainbow serpent. You'll see all the pictures. So here, the other aspect of this little technology, before we go on to measuring what goes through death, just to show you, is that, does anybody here study Tantra? Tantra. <laughs> Maybe this. It, it turns out that that the science of Tantra is about the science of having two people's electric field, their aura, their plasma, how to make a fuse and become one. It's the psychology of alchemy or fusion, which is the subject of Shakespeare's plays, for example. How to make fusion between, well, it turns out that this process, it's called Tantra, is actually measurable. It's a process of teaching people to link hearts. Now, maybe that's a bit of a controversial example. This, this is my technology called the heart tuner, where we teach empathy by measurement. For example, the leading bank in Australia, ANZ Bank in Melbourne, purchased my system. And what they wanted to do was teach the bank managers how to get on the same wavelength as their clients. You see, they have Aboriginal black people over here, and they have weird British white people over here, and everything's in between. And how is the bank manager going to be able to feel the feelings of all those different people? They call this the Cultural Breakout Program at ANZ Bank nationally in Australia, and they purchased my system to help teach their bank managers how to get on the same wavelength as their clients. And this is called the measurement of empathy. So empathy is teachable by measurement. And here's how we do it. It's really quite simple. It's called the heart tuner. I'm credited in the literature with inventing the word <coughs> heart coherence because I invented this mathematics of how to measure coherence in the heart. You know, if you say to somebody, I love you, and if you really mean it, there's something that happens in your heart. It's right here. I think the EKG, the, the electric cardiogram of two people, I do a spectrum analysis of power spectra, frequency signature, harmonic analysis. You can look for missing frequencies, and you can heal your heart by replacing the missing frequencies. Musical disorder. And down here, I take a second order power spectrum. It's called a septum. And I can measure internal phase coherence in your heart, which simply means that <coughs> if you say to somebody, when I'm measuring the amount of coherence in your heart, the difference between coherence and non-coherence is the difference between a flashlight and a laser. You know the difference? What's the difference between a flashlight and a laser? With a laser, the light goes farther, right? What makes the light go so far? It's called coherent light. That's a laser. Well, it turns out that if you feel love, your heart becomes a laser. And it's measurable. And this is how you measure it. And it's called coherent emotion, and I invented the word, okay? So actually, <coughs> the way it works is, if he says, I love you, I'd like to marry you, 
and this goes up, then she should say yes. However, if he says, I love you, I want to marry you, and this goes down, then she better say no. <laughs> it's actually true. You see, you need to understand why this is a lie detector. Pardon? Yes, yes, it's the heart tuner. We're in our fifth hardware version. The new version is called the love tuner. And I, yes, yes, and we. It's, it's, it's being used for marriage counseling, actually. Yes. And, and, and you can read about the newest version at thelovetuner.com. So, but I, this is all fun stuff. And it's, it's, it's as fun as it sounds, but let me help you to understand the principle. Now you're thinking about this. How come, why, this, this is a simple why, that if you, if you say something that is the truth, that you feel from inside, that your heart coherence goes up. The phase coherence, the lasering of your heart goes up. Whereas if you tell a lie, it's actually true your heart coherence goes down. This is a lie detector. I actually built polygraphs in university. I thought I'd never build a lie detector, but I did. Oh, well. But you need to know why. Biologically, your heart knows which waves can be shared. And that ability of a wave to be shared, called heart coherence, very measurable, defines pure intention in the sense that it defines which wave can serve all other waves? Biology happens to know that. How does your heart know so well which waves can be shared? I'll give you another clue. The perfection of coherence is fractal. Okay? We'll come back to that word again and again. Now, because of lack of time, I don't have time to show you this, but someday we're going to come back here and we're going to set this gadget up and you're going to sit here two by two have a little fun and see who's part of I tell you, it is the ultimate teenage party game. Really, it's fabulous for Valentine's Day. <laughs> owing to time constraints, and because your teachers are wondering what this guy up front is doing, I, 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 want, I, I want to move on to, to, to just one more subject. Remember, Ask me. Remember, I'm you, I told you that we were going to talk about what it is that survives death. But before I tell you what it is that survives death, I need to show you a couple more things. This is... When we went to Prague, we need international conferences on unified field physics and alchemy, and we had several of them in Prague. This is the original magnetic map of the city of Prague. <coughs> And we found there that the original map of the city is a rose. So why was the map for the design of the city of Prague original a rose? I have a lot more information on that. I'd like you to meditate on that if you like. But I will tell you one thing. We discovered that while we were there, we were able to lucid dream a lot better. You know what a lucid dream is? When you kind of can go somewhere real in a dream and you can test it. You're taking your plasma with you. If you can lucid dream well, you're going to do well at the moment of death. Whereas if you can't lucid dream well, you need to practice because you're going to need that skill when you die. And I, I tell you that as an electrical engineer. Uh, yes? Say, say again. How can you lucid dream? That's the right question. Thank you for asking the right question. Well, one of the things we observed is that when you're, in a, when you're in a place that the magnetism looks like this, it's a rose. You can lose the dream best. I can tell you that in person. So, for example, if the magnetic map of the place where you're dreaming, a garden, stone circle, old tree, if the, if the magnetic map looks like a rose, lucid dreaming is more possible. And we now know why, because the plasma of your aura, the same thing you're going to take with you when you die, has a way to be distributed. And that's actually where we're going with this. We're wanting to understand the design of architecture. Remember, now we're talking about how to create a space 
that makes the electric field that causes seed to germinate, and the same electric field, which is fractal, allows you to lose the dream. I can give you another clue. That is called the dreaming trap in Aboriginal Australia, the black people of Aboriginal Australia. They call it the dreaming trap. And we have measured those lines. We know what they are. They are an electric fractal. They're a river for magnetism. And that's where your plasma goes when you dream and when you die. I'm going to show you the measurement just so you see the reality of this science. Here we're building a we're building a stone temple outside of Byron Bay in Australia to make the electric field to cause seeds to germinate. These stones are five-sided, they're piezoelectric, paramagnetic, they're a lens for magnetism or charge, they invite compression, and they're the new stonehenge. They cause the electric field that creates life. Remember, subject of this lecture, new fractal science of life. So I wanted to show you one more picture. <clears throat> well, a couple. You know, in Feng Shui, it's considered bad Feng Shui to sit by a 90 degree right corner. Yeah? It's bad Feng Shui. A sharp corner is bad Feng Shui. Well, now we know why. Because the charge lines destructively interfere at a right angle. Whereas if they occur at a five-sided or three-sided angle, the electric waves are constructive, not destructive. And that defines good or bad feng shui, actually sacred space. So here's some more experiments we did with seed germination. The seeds that you plant in steel and aluminum, <coughs> the seeds that you plant in stone and wood, what's the reason? We need to know the reason if we want to design the architecture of the future. Remember, the reason why we're here today is because we came, I actually helped sponsor the second international conference on biologic architecture. Biological Architecture at UK. We just came from the conference where we met Mauricio. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. In Cardiff, Wales. Our first conference was in Mexico City. We had 300 international professionals, and we were discovering biologic <coughs> architecture. This is the first conference in Mexico City. Two years ago, I sponsored the conference and wrote the curriculum. Here is Ron Eglosh making his famous presentation. You know what it's called? called Fractality in African Architecture. <coughs> you know what the name for Enki in South Africa was? Kiliman, Kilimanjaro. You know what the name for Enki in Persia was? Zarathustra. And you know whose scientist this was? His scientist was Hermes, so Ningashita, right? So these guys knew something about the design for life, and the symbol for Hermes was the caduceus. We're back to being fractal, this perfect geometry. So, in the, in the video, this is a very famous video at TED, you can see it at TED.com. Ronnie Glosh is explaining how the Africans got it right. And what they did was, they built their village. So the shape of the whole village is the same as the shape of one house in the village. And the shape of the shaman's house in the village was the same shape as the altar inside the shaman's house. The name for this principle, where the inside looks like the outside, looks like the outside, the name for that principle is called... Right. Thank you. Louder? Louder? Right. Good. Good. We're getting it. Okay. Now, it turns out that when, when you go to this place, in the center of the village, this is where the shaman go when they say, <clears throat> we're having a little survival issue here today, so we got to go talk to our ancestors. <clears throat> You know what the Italian word for ancestors is? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Antonati means ancestors. <laughs> That's a good clue. <laughs> okay. So if they, when they want to go to talk to their ancestors, they go to that place in the village. And then they go, they sit there, and they go into a trance, and they can hear the voices of their ancestors. And that has wonderful survival value, very important. If you do trance properly with astral hygiene, it serves a wonderful survival value. So... Our friend, Dr. Karakov, decided he needed to measure, to measure. Let's turn this into physics now. Let's teach this to electrical engineers <coughs> so it can make it to your biology school. <coughs> so he measured the nature of that place. And you know what? It was fractal. This is a measure simply of charge distribution efficiency. It's called fractality in air. It uses the same technology that... Electric waves in a sacred space 
say, oh, look, there's all kinds of places to go. <laughs> Whereas electric waves in a nasty metal building with nasty electrospot, those electric waves say, oh darn, we're stuck here, isolated, no place for charge to go. That difference, that difference, the nature, the difference between charge distribution perfected, called fractal, and no charge distribution called a bad space. That difference defines the safety. And that difference defines how you make the electric field to cause a seed to germinate. And it's actually true. Now, I have a technology. I recommend the new website, fractalfield.com. Our international commercial research group, we have the leading physicists from around the world on this project, and you are welcome to join us. Seriously. You can also look at breakthrough-technologies.com, but fractalfield.com is easy to remember. And you'll see that we've invented three new hydrogen technologies, seed treatment technologies, a new science of life. It's true. Now, the closing of this little fun little conversation, this little dance, <coughs> fitting for closing, is about death. <coughs> More, a little bit. Remember, I promised you, this is quite, quite a seat. <laughs> <laughs> I promised you, well, first, before I do that, any questions? Any questions about what I, I shared so far? Anything at all? Yes? How much stuff have you actually invented? I've invented two major biofeedback systems the heart tuner, the tuner. I've invented a water treatment device. It's called Implosion Science. And what we do is we teach water molecules to implode. You, have, you, have you ever heard of Victor Schauberger? The actual spin path to center that allows a water molecule to implode, you can take sewage water and paste, place it through an implosion device, and it will sediment so fast that sewage water will turn into drinking water after it's imploded. It's hydrodynamically spun to the point of centripetal implosion. Victor Schauberger is an example. We do the physics. We've also invented three new hydrogen technologies. Actually, you can see a list of almost 20 different inventions if you just go to Breakthrough, B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-U, Breakthrough-Technologies.com. And you'll see our international science group. This is serious stuff. We're cooking, and we want to involve the young people. And that's you. <laughs> but... In order to do this, excuse me, in order to make this work, it's serious, you guys need to be willing to learn a little science. You've got to know what an electric field is. You've got to know what symmetry is, or we can't have this conversation. You see? The problem with religion wars is everybody's been talking about spirit using different languages. It turns out that the physics is a language of unification. And when you use physics to understand spirit, it gets more romantic, more beautiful, and more fun, and more loving. It's actually true. But you need serious science to do this work. So that's why... Anybody else want to ask a question before I finish? Yes, yes, please, go ahead. Because you know how we said the plasma, the charged field of the plant, <coughs> is the memory of life for that plant? Well, it turns out that the plasma, the charged field of your body, what you used to call a ghost, which by the way is measurable, is the memory of your life, or can be. I know it's hard for you to believe that all this romantic idea you have about life and consciousness is the same thing as electric field theory. But I tell you, I have devoted my life to this. And I'm staking my life on this, that if you understand electric field theory, you can understand the nature of consciousness, and you can take, you can understand the nature of what you take through death. And that's what I'm here to share with you. And it is a unified field. And I need to show you a few more slides to really talk about that. That's what's coming up now. But yes, go ahead. No. 
No, I believe that what we have called God is the beautiful, self-aware intelligence of electric fields that gathers survival information at the center of DNA radio. And that plasma field is called the phase conjugate dielectric, and it's precisely the physics of what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious, and it obeys physical laws, and it's beautiful, and it's low. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, if we take a seed, for example... Yeah, a seed, yes. ...and we boil it or make sure there's no life in it... Yes. ...will you be able to make it germinate? <laughs> there are lots of pictures of a beautiful saint taking a rose in their hand, and you can watch the rose open. If I take a seed and boil it, will you plant it in the ground and make it germinate? If you boil the seed, there are a lot of seeds that will survive boiling, actually. Well, if something. I kill it? Yeah. Um, to, to a limited extent, it is possible to restore life, yes. A limited extent? Yes, there are... If the seed has no life in it, you can't put that back into it. Actually, you can't. You can't no. Yeah. But now, it, it is true. I mean, if you understand the physics of plasma well, you understand what a shaman does when they do soul retrieval. But I, I'm interrupted here. Just one Look, this conversation definitely goes to some very esoteric subjects. And these are beautiful and appropriate questions. And the very deep mystical science of how you bring someone back to life is an electrical engineering issue. But we're not quite ready to have that conversation at this moment. But, you know, in Robin Williams, in What Dreams May Come, after somebody commits suicide, how hard it is to go find the threads of their memory, their soul, the soul retrieval. <laughs> so it's the same for you. If you get depressed and your aura begins to dissipate, that thread that should be insolvable, insoluble, actually begins to disappear. So I tell you, that understanding the nature of how you charge your plasma, your ka, is an important scientific subject worthy of scientific research, and the very nature of life is, w is something we can understand. And yes, we can bring things back to life. But this is a deep question. Let's start in the beginning first. Yes? Please. Um, somebody, well, should we? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Last question, then we do our slides again. Yes. That's, that's beautiful. So Can questions you about yeah. accessing the memories and experiences of your ancestors by understanding your relationship to the shape of the magnetic lines of the Earth. So let's, this is the slide I did not show you, but I should have. This is an airplane <coughs> satellite magnetic map of Greaterwood outside of Canberra, Australia. And the black lines are roads and towns. But the white and the color is a map of magnetism. It's simply a river for DC magnetic current. And you know what these are? These are the song lines, the dreaming tracks. This is literally what the ancestors said is where our spirit, our dreaming goes when we die. And where the magnetic lines, the dreaming tracks converge, that's where they put a town. And you know what? That's a better place to die. Because your plasma has some place to go. This is called introduction to fractally and magnetic lines. Now, we're doing a whole international outreach on advanced geobiology, geomancy. Valerie's translating the leading French authors in the world, uh, Stephen Cardino's work. So we're actually assembling international teams of geobiologists who can teach this now. But it's really quite simple. Your plasma, your spirit, needs a road. Yeah? Look, there's an altar at Machu Picchu. What did they use it for? It was a place to get born and to die. If you get born and die in a hospital, your plasma has no place to go because the electrosmog and the people who built it didn't know what life is. So I'm introducing to you actually today the electrical engineering of successful death. And that's what I want to show you these slides briefly and then that's going to be the end of our little song and dance for today.
Here is. So just five minutes more, and then we're done. Yeah. So here is, here is some of our friends that at an Italian rave festival, and we're not sure that these friends might have had a few drugs, so maybe it wasn't. But they were actually, we were measuring their plasma. Now, you know what these are called? These are called the orbs. You've probably heard of them. You know, you say you see the twinkle in someone's eye. If you look at the geometry of that electric field, the plasma, the little orb, the little ball, the little bubble, if you look at the shape of that, you know what the shape is? See the torus shape, donut shape? The top left is this shape, and the bottom right is the shape of a little diamond. It's actually a dodecaecosa. So the plasma, the twinkle in someone's eye, is actually an electric field that gets into a geometry that uses golden ratio. And this is the life you see coming off bodies. These are called orbs. They're very famous. So we have many pictures of this. You know, you say, she was the apple in her father's eye, <laughs> or she was the twinkle in his eye, you know? Well, it's an electric field. It's plasma. And it got centripetal, self-organizing, by being <coughs> fractal, by using the geometry of golden mean, pentagonal dodecahedron. So this is the, the slide about death. This is our friend. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Dr. Karatkoff, quite a hero. And this, the German article was called, does anybody read German? Yeah, he comes. No. What's, what's, what's say like? It's the soul. Uh, so the soul, thank you, right? So why is this article about soul? Huh? This is an electrical engineering class, right? <laughs> so. What he's done is he's taken he's taken a group of volunteers, except they were not volunteers because they were dead. No, <laughs> they couldn't volunteer. They couldn't volunteer because they were already dead. He actually took a group of people from the morgue, dead people, people who had died, and he used the same physics, the same technology. And he measured the time it takes for your aura, your plasma, your chi, your spirit, your ghost. He measured how long it takes for that electric field to leave your body after death. And he did it over a statistic population. This is an electrical engineering study, the electrical design of death. And sure enough, he found out that if, if your death is peaceful, and hopefully you died in a place where the charge was a little bit ordered, that at 10 hours and 36 hours after death is the time when the peak amount of capacitance, charge, electric field, plasma leaves the body. And further, he was able to measure the shape of a ghost, the plasma. And further, if you read the literature, and that's the book Light After Light, I recommend it, that we actually know where you go, when you die, and why you go there. And it turns out that what a ghost does at the moment of death, and this is part of the definition of sacred architecture, that at the moment of death, a, a ghost goes to the place in a room where there's a compression, where there's a, um, a place where charge converges. So effectively, you know in the movie Ghost, uh, Flatliners, there's lots of movies about this, but you learn something about what actually happens to ghosts. And what they do is, they go to a place here. This is biologic architecture, right? Architecture is about making a place that has a center, a heart. It's a place where waves converge. And this compression, this fractal, this heart of space that you make electrically when you build biologic architecture is the place that a ghost wants to go. And the reason is this is a place where compression can become acceleration. And in the most time, space velocity, golden ratio, it's fun stuff. Anyway, in addition to knowing where the ghost goes at the moment of death, we learn something else about death that I want to share with you. <coughs> there was another scientist called Heinrich Kluve who he took a large number of people who were volunteers. Because even though they had died, they came back. This is called the NDE, the near-death experiences. And 
so people who had had death experiences, and there's large numbers of them, if you interview them and say, <coughs> well, you just went on a trip, you didn't go to Paris, you died. Oh, cool. All right. Well, what did it look like? Give me that. Okay. So they actually did. And they interviewed these people who had died and come back, and they all said, well, first we saw a lattice, then we saw a cobweb, then we saw a tunnel, then we saw a spiral. And then it started over. If you're driving to Paris, get a mask. If you're going to die, I recommend a mask. So we, we needed... We needed, to, we needed to understand where this geometry came from, the heinrich Cuvé form constant. And we studied to figure out why were people always seeing this when they died. Important to know so you can understand your mess, right? Okay, here's the why. It turns out that the way in which DNA the way in which DNA is folded, you know, the, the DNA in your blood, the braiding of DNA uses a sequence of folding operations to allow the charge to be compressed. <clears throat> you know how if you go to a doctor and say, a lady, and she says, I'm having menopause and I'm having blue flashes, the doctor says, oh, I have a pill for that. <clears throat> but actually what the doctor didn't know was that the blue flash is the ultraviolet part of your aura that's finally saying, I can go through the speed of light. And what your DNA knows that your doctor does not know is that it's fatal to be stuck below the speed of light. You see, it's, it's actually deathly for your plasma not to be accelerated. So in fact, at menopause or when you're having bliss or good conflict sex, you see blue like uh, violet uh, aura, like indigo kids, you know, you see this radiance, because part of your plasma is accelerated. And that ability to do that is your DNA preparing you to die. And this is actually how your DNA is graded. You see this, the bottom center there? That's actually the way your DNA is folding. So it's a lattice, it's a cobweb, it's a tunnel, it's a spiral. It's your DNA preparing you for death. So actually what's happening is that your biologic plasma, your aura is going, you know how at the moment of death they say you see your whole life passing in front of you, very compressed? Do you know why you see that compression? Because your plasma is saying anything that can survive compression can be distributed. That's what fractality is. Perfect compression creates perfect distribution. Perfect distribution defines abundance in economics, and it defines immortality for charge. This was, Mauricio brought this, brought this in. You know, when the waves get lined up in a 3D fractal, they're like this. If I pick one up here, if there were a million balls in this row, and I picked up one down here, one at the other end would pop off almost instantly. The reason the one at the other end pops off almost instantly is because none of the balls in between have to move. They can stay perfectly still. And yet they're totally participating in the distribu distribution of charge. When waves are locked into a fractal, what you feel when you have rapture and ecstasy and bliss, you feel like you're locked in a vice-like grip electrically. It's called kundalini. I'm an expert on the medical science of that. But what happens is that this creates what's called perfected distribution because of zero storage. And if you want to design a new economics, which the world badly needs, that's called fractal money. And fractal money creates distribution that's perfect, perfect because storage has been eliminated. And that's the definition of abundance in economics, and it's the definition of what happens to charge in a fractal, you see? And that defines the divine, the scion, the perfect branching, the word behind the word science. So, actually, the advanced science here is just that our biological aura, the plasma around our body, creates something that's of use to the universe. It actually gives a reason to live. And the, the practical homework for the class, this is the, now did they tell you there was homework here today? No. no. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's homework. Here's the homework. That's a good thing. Yay. The homework assignment for today's class is you need to go home and you need to make your aura bigger. Now, what is the technique for doing it? We divide the technique for doing that into four basic categories. First category is eat live food. Live food means you need live enzyme food. You see, an enzyme is alive because it's fractal. Now you know what makes an enzyme alive, don't you? Its electric field can flow. The grading algorithm of its molecules make it a charge attractor that defines life. So if you eat food where the enzymes are alive, your digestion is implosive, your awareness is implosive, it's cool. It means salad and fresh veggies and dump the dead food, okay? Second thing, and it should be 50 to 70% live food if you want to do this right. Um, second thing, do not eat angry DNA. <laughs> <laughs> you know what angry DNA is? <laughs> Let me give you an example of angry DNA. The, the wheat seed that was in the white flour in the bun that you had at lunch, that wheat has been in monoculture for hundreds of generations. You know what that does? It makes angry DNA. You know why it's angry? Did you ever meet a boy whose father's 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 father has been in jail for a hundred generations? That kid's going to be pretty mad, ain't he? <laughs> well, the thing is the same with DNA. DNA gets fractal because of gen genetic diversity. It's called the Monsanto mistake. Right? So genetic diversity is what creates fractality for the electric field of DNA, and that's what makes DNA's electric field, its plasma, smart, self-organized. So next time you're picking out your food in the grocery store, just whisper, when was the last, last time you experienced genetic diversity? Yeah. So there's a quinoa, there's an amaranth, there are seeds, yeah? The second thing is, so that's the introduction to the diet. Also, you should avoid fried food because it fries your brain, you know the whole story, you know that story. So you need food that actually creates life force, step one, a, a, a live food diet. Also, if you're going to eat animal protein, you need to be prepared to sort out the memories of that animal. It's okay, sometimes it can be useful, but you better be prepared, prepared to make the agreement. Yeah? Next thing. The yoga, the way you get the electric field strength to have bliss is yoga. Do you know what yoga is? It's when you do the, the discipline, the physical discipline. It's like Tai Chi. In the Tai Chi, have you ever seen the, the Tai Chi master who can take their Dan Tian and they can push you over without appearing to move? Have you seen that? Very famous. You got a good Tai Chi master. You're standing there. He's over there. And suddenly... And he didn't move. Okay? You know how did he do that? He moved an electric field with his attention. You want to practice moving an electric field with your attention. Put your attention in your little finger. Just sit there. Try it. Just, just put your attention in your Focus in your baby finger for just a minute. Put as much attention in your little finger as you can. Okay, what do you feel? Anyone? I feel very happy. You feel happy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you feel? Come on. What do you feel in your little finger? It's kind of like, you can feel like some Yeah, like... Yes. Yes, what was that? So, so you put your attention in your little finger and you felt something, didn't you? What was it? Why did your attention put that tingling presence? If I were measuring your GDV at that moment, your aura would have gotten bigger right there. So what happened? Your attention moved an electric field. Sorry, so how do I push someone over? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you right. How do I push someone over? How, how do you push someone? That's the right question. So what you do is eventually the quality of your attention can move more and more charge. And this is, this is the inner work to build a quality of attention. This is what Gurdjieff was talking about. This is how a shaman steers a tornado. A shaman steers a tornado by feeling the pain of the tornado, and then the electric field of the, of the tornado becomes the body of the shaman because he, his plasma embeds in the tornado. The tornado's pain was whatever part of it was not practical. And that's what defines pain, you see? So 
This, this is why you need yoga in order to have bliss and charge your aura. Because you need to get the inner muscles to move an electric field with your attention. It's why your body was designed based on golden mean ratio, 0.618. Because the spark gap at the end of your fingers is a cascade of spirals of golden ratio to compress an electric field. You know where the finger of God touches man? On the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? That's a spark gap. So, summary, you're going to need some form of discipline, yoga, sacred gymnastics, some form of movement in which you can get your aura assembled. Third category, environment. When you, when you walk down the street, have you noticed that if you walk on concrete that has steel underneath it, your feet get tired? You know why? Because the magnetic field. The reason that if you walk on floors that have steel and metal in them, you feel like there, and you feel bad, and your feet, your feet get tired very quickly. Whereas if you have the same walk, and you're walking on wood, or natural stone, or natural fabric, your feet feel all bouncy. It's a very simple example, but it's important. The reason that you get tired so quickly when you're near steel and aluminum is because they are opposite to fractal, opposite to phase conjugate. They create harmonic exclusiveness, and simply put, they bleed your charge. So biologic architecture has to avoid steel and aluminum because these are structures that bleed charge. They create exclusive instead of inclusive or fractal properties. So, to live inside an environment that is conducive to charge, it's so important. You know, hundreds of yogis, it's well documented in India, hundreds of them live to be a thousand years old. Well known. Yes, it's, it's very, you can talk to all kinds of people who have interviewed these yogis, yeah. it's very true. Hundreds and hundreds of years old, there's yogis like this all over India, and elsewhere for that matter. But you know what? Where did they accomplish this? Anybody know? Not one of them. Not one of them ever did it in a metal building. You know why? Because their aura could not be charged. So this is, this is what it is about finding a place that's vibrant with nature, that's vibrant with charge. It's called fractal field. And you can read about the deep science of biologic architecture, how to choose a space which is charge enhancing, which is fractal, instead of charge bleeding. So the third category, remember we said diet, movement, the kinesthetic, and environment. The third category is always be aware. The place where you do your homework, that's a very practical thing. If the place where you do your homework has six power transformers over there, and all the wires are over here, and steel's over there, and there's noise over there, the plasma cannot compress. You will not get the tension, and your aura will disappear. Whereas if the place where you do your homework, all the power transformers are off. They're away from your body. The desk is made of natural material. The light is at least emulating sunlight, if not close. Okay, you've avoided electrosmog and avoided synthetic experiments, and you have air that's full of charge. That environment will allow you to do your homework and pass a test, because that's the environment that allows the charge to compress, and that's what causes attention. That's invitation to voice. So you see where this is going. Yes, sir? The, the, um, the, the science of which metal, for example, can create life force is called uh, PGM or platinum group metals. And you can read about it, um, about the PGM metals, they're well known. I, I'll just show you a table that we've seen. Um, we have the proceedings of the first and second international unified field science congresses in Budapest. Uh, it is it is groundbreaking. It's very new. It's very new. Yes, yes. This, this, this is the table. This is the table in that article. The material in an environment create light force. These, these are called uh, fractal or phase conjugate materials. You can read about phase conjugate dielectrics in the scientific publications, for example, of Tom Beard. Okay. So, there is a little in way of actual evidence to what they said. And what you just said about young. 
Well, we, we actually wrote about some of them and interviewed some of those in our format. We, we published it in the book um, uh, Implosion, Secret Science of Ecstasy and Mortality. But the yogi group in Australia, uh, what was his name? Uh, I forget the name, but it's in the book. There's lots of e evidence of those kinds of things. The people living to be hundreds of years old in India. It's pretty well known. You, you can doubt it. Yeah, that's true. We absolutely need the open debate. You're right. And you're right to suggest publication. And we're working on that. And a lot of this is new. But you see the table here that you can actually create an environment that causes life to yeah. So it's getting late here. I just want to give you one last little... We call this a throwaway bus. Oh, yes, question? I have a question. Do you know why it's very close to the Buddhist philosophy? Yes. Which is the aura in the front. Yes. Yes. The aura is this. The aura is what it's about. Yes. And it is about the Buddhist philosophy. Could you be quiet? So we hear. Sir, speak out. If you concentrate it on the board, you can see it. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. And that's a beautiful example. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So the very. <laughs> well. <laughs> You have to repeat them. Yeah, thank you, dude. That, that was so beautiful. You have to repeat them because uh, them. That, that is where we wanted to go. We want, what we want to do here is see how we unify religion. I just want to show you just one last slide. That this is this is just a teaser to take home with you, okay? But we we then model the angle at which DNA can absorb. Can you do Physics calls this the ether, the unified field. And this is, now it appears to be a very intelligent mind. We want to call that God. We know it can't be loaded. We also know it's beautiful physics. So that's the right question. So you didn't answer it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> 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 well, we say that it's a unified universal substance. It's the material that unifies the field. And you're right. And, sir, you are correct. Physics does not know where to find They do not know where to find Thank you. So this is the last slide. I don't know if you can even see it. I just wanted to share with you that we observe that the angle at which DNA absorbs charge if we index those angles based on the tetrahedron, I'm sorry the projector is not that clear, but on the bottom left, see that spiral there? This is Aleph, Beit, Enel, Dalit. So I've taken this golden mean spiral on this donut, and I've looked at the angles I'm looking at the shadow views of this donut, Alam, Beit, Imogal, and Kate, and the shadows of this spiral on this donut, the angle at which DNA can absorb electric field, is creating, as you see here, the Hebrew alphabet. Do you know what that means? The, the Hebrew alphabet was a sequence of the symmetry of electric fields to allow DNA to absorb charge. And that's the index to all biologic memory. That could give you a little clue here to how the ancient concept of the sacred is actually the physics of symmetry. And we've derived the Sanskrit as well. I'm just saying to you that the origin of symbol and alphabet lies deeply in this mystery. I'm just planting this little seed for your intrigue as you sleep tonight. Yes, last question.
So it's getting late. I really wanted to thank you. Thank you all for your patience. You need to go through registration, please. Yes, thank you.